Hey guys, Jake here, coming at you with another math lesson today. Here's the problem I'm going to be showing you today, continuing on the theme of related rates this week. Today I have another related rates triangle problem, you know, basically related rates changing angle problem within a triangle. Um, I did a, a problem kind of similar to this a couple days ago, so uh, you can check that out. The link is up here and I'll, there's a link down in the description as well. Um, but let's jump into this problem. So we have a plane flies horizontally at an altitude of five kilometers and passes directly over a tracking telescope on the ground. When the angle of elevation is pi over three, this angle is decreasing at a rate of pi over six radians per minute. How fast is the plane traveling at this time? So just like any other related rates problem, we're gonna follow the same four step process. And the first of those four steps is to draw a sketch of what you're dealing with. Um, so let's kind of think about the information we have, first of all, um, and then we will draw what that looks like. So first of all, our plane is five kilometers above the ground. It's flying horizontally and it flies over this telescope. At this moment when we're kind of measuring and looking at, we know that the angle of elevation is pi over three and it's decreasing at a rate of pi over six radians per minute. So that's really all the information we're given. So let's think about what that would look like if we draw it out. So this pretty much sums up all the information that we were actually given, right? We have the telescope right here. We have the plane, which flew over that telescope. We know that the plane is flying horizontally and we know that it's five kilometers above the ground. That's the altitude they gave us. And then it also tell us, tells us that this angle of elevation between the telescope to the plane is pi over three at the moment that we're given. And it also tells us that this angle is decreasing at a rate of pi over six radians per minute. So I just kind of called this theta. You can pretty much call this angle whatever you want, but assuming that we're gonna call it theta, we were told that that angle of elevation is decreasing at a rate of pi over six. So basically what that tells us kind of in mathematical terms is d theta dt is negative pi over six because d theta dt represents the rate of change of this angle of elevation and it's negative pi over six because it told us that the angle is decreasing at a rate of pi over six radians per minute so there isn't really a good way to draw this in our drawing so i just kind of wrote it off to the side but that was information that we were given uh, the last thing i want to kind of mention within our drawing we weren't really given any information about you know, you could kind of think of this as a triangle. We weren't really given any information about this bottom side length or this hypotenuse side length. So what I'm going to do just kind of for to make sure that we have a, a complete drawing, let's just call this side length X and this side length Z. So like I said, we don't have any information about X or Z, but we know that those are sides of our triangle which are going to be changing over time right as our plane moves this way the telescope is not moving so this bottom side length as this five kilometer long side moves over this way since the plane is moving horizontally we know that this side is going to stay five kilometers right the plane is going to stay five kilometers above the ground so basically as time goes on this side of our triangle is just going to kind of move along this way and this hypotenuse is obviously going to stay connected to the top of this side, five kilometers above the ground. And so this angle will be kind of shrinking over time as this side length grows to match this one over here. And then also this one is obviously going to be growing as well as this vertical side length here moves along this way. So X and Z are both variables because we know they're both going to be changing. This side length we don't need to assign a variable to because we know that it's a constant. We know the plane is always going to be five kilometers above the ground. And we know that because the problem told us that the plane is flying horizontally. So that kind of phrasing basically means that the distance between it and the ground is going to remain constant because the ground is horizontal. So basically the path of the plane is going to be parallel to the ground. So this is really all we need for our drawing. So that's it for the first step. Now the second step of any related rates problem is to come up with your equation. When you're doing this, you want to think about a couple things. First of all, what is the question asking you to find? And if you think back to the question, the last thing it said was 
how fast is the plane traveling at this time? So we want to think about what in this drawing represents how fast the plane is traveling. Well, if you think about, you know, measuring speed of an object, really all that is, is comparing that object to some stationary point and then thinking about how fast the distance between that object and the stationary point is changing. So this telescope is a good reference point because we know it's not going to move. However, we don't just want to look at how quickly this distance between the plane and the telescope is moving because the plane is not moving perfectly away from the telescope. If it were moving in this direction, then we could use that as our reference point because it was moving perfectly away from the telescope. What we want to actually use is this distance here because the plane is moving horizontally, right? So this vertical side of our triangle is going to be moving perfectly away from this reference point in a you know straight line away from it. So really, the rate of change of this side here tells us how fast our plane is moving because our plane is moving parallel to this side line. So what that means is the thing that we want to find is dx dt, which is just how quickly this side length is increasing. That'll represent the speed that the plane is moving. So we know we want to find dx dt. That's our final goal. Once we find dx dt, that is going to be our answer. However, our equation should not have d anything dt in it. It should not have any rates of change yet. That won't come until the third step. In our second step, we just want to put you know, distances, volumes, you know, of physical measurements, basically, and not worry about how those things are changing. Therefore, we know that what our equation actually should have is just x, because if our equation has an x in it, once we move on to the implicit differentiation step, that'll get us to a dx dt. So we know our equation should have an x in it. Now what we also want to think about is what other information we know that we can relate to x somehow. So if we look at our triangle, we let's think about our side lengths first of all. We know that x and dx dt are going to be related to our answer. We know those have to be in there. If we look at this side length, we know at this moment that we're looking at, and really any moment, we know that this side length is going to be 5 kilometers. And also, since it's a constant, since it's never changing, we know that the rate of change of this side length is zero. So we know this side length and we also know its rate of change. At this moment, we do not know this side length and we also have no information about its rate of change. So Z is probably not a good variable to include in our equation here, just simply because we don't have very much information about it. We don't know its length and we don't know its rate of change. X has to be there. This side length is good because we know its length and we know its rate of change, but Z should not be in there. The other piece that we do have some information about is theta, right? We know at this moment that we're looking at, we know the angle of theta, and not only that, we also know its rate of change. We know the measurement itself, and we know its rate of change. So theta is a good thing to have in our equation. So basically what we need is some equation that will relate this angle to this side length and this side length. So what things do we know about that do that? Well, we can use sine, cosine, or tangent, because sine, cosine, or tangent all relate one angle of a right triangle to two of its sides. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We need to relate this angle to these two sides. So which one do we want to use if we're trying to use this angle along with the adjacent side and the opposite side, right? If you're considering this as your reference angle, we know that this is going to be the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is always opposite of the 90 degree angle. And since this is our reference angle, this side down here is adjacent to that angle. And this side over here is opposite of that angle. Well, that's exactly what tangent does, right? Tangent of an angle is equivalent to the opposite side length divided by the adjacent side length. So if we take tan of this angle, that'll be 5 over x. So this is a perfect equation because it has the thing that we know has to be in there and then it has theta and this other side length which we know their measurements and their rate of change. So we have lots of information about 
everything in this equation except the one thing that we're actually looking for, which obviously we aren't gonna know any information about that. But before we go into the next step, let's just think about how we could rewrite this to be a little bit easier when we have to take the derivative. Because at this point we have a fraction here and I don't really wanna to have to use quotient rule because it's more difficult. What we can do is rewrite this as tangent of theta equals five times x to the negative first power, right? These two things are the same. Moving it out of the denominator is just the same as raising it to the negative first power. But when we have to take the derivative of this term over here, we can do it with the power rule instead of the quotient rule. So it's a little bit easier. So that's it for our equation. That's all we need for that step. Now we can move on to the third step, which is applying implicit differentiation. So all that means is we're going to be taking the derivative of both sides of this equation with respect to time. So before we jump into that, I do want to take just a second to think about finding the derivative of tangent of theta. So in general, let's say we were taking the derivative of tan theta with respect to theta. So we're treating theta as our variable. I know that's not what we're going to be doing here, but um, this is kind of the first step in finding that derivative. If we were taking the derivative with respect to this variable here, what we would want to do is treat tangent theta as sine over cosine. And then because we know tan of theta, tan of anything is the same as sine over cosine of that same variable. So from here, we could just use quotient rule to find this derivative, but I'm, I'm not gonna go through all the details of that. If you wanna try it, go ahead and, and give that a try. But this would be the same as one over cosine squared of theta. So we're gonna kinda use this when we're taking the derivative with respect to time here, because one over cosine squared is gonna come into play. There's just gonna be one added step as a result of taking the derivative with respect to time instead of theta. So if we're taking the derivative with respect to time of this whole equation, both sides of the equation, we're going to have to use chain rule for both sides, right? Because we're taking the derivative with respect to time. So what that means is theta and x both have to be treated as functions of time. So taking the derivative of tan theta with respect to time, we're going to have to do chain rule, which means take the derivative of the outside piece, leave the inside alone, and then multiply that by the derivative of our inside. So if our inside is just theta, taking the derivative of the outside and leaving the inside alone is gonna give us one over cosine squared of theta, just like what we were just talking about a second ago. Now, because we're taking the derivative with respect to time, we have to multiply this by the derivative of our inside function. Well, the derivative of theta with respect to time is just d theta dt because we don't have an explicit formula for theta, so we can't really find its derivative. So this is the best we can do. This symbol here literally just means the derivative of theta with respect to time. So that's our left side. Now our right side, we're going to be able to use power rule and chain rule. So our, we'll treat our inside function as just x. So this is our inside function. So if we take the derivative of the outside function, leave the inside alone, that's just gonna mean power rule, right? Bring the negative one down in front, leave the inside alone, lower the power by one, and then multiply that by the derivative of our inside function. Well, x is a function of time, so the derivative of x with respect to time is just dx dt. So that's it for your implicit differentiation step. Now we can go on to the fourth step, which is solving for the desired rate of change. Now remember, what we're looking for is how fast the plane is traveling, which is exactly what I said dx dt represented earlier. So all we have to do is solve for dx dt. So what we can do is multiply both sides of our equation by negative one fifth, and that'll cancel the negative five here. So times negative one fifth times negative one fifth over here. And then we can also multiply both sides by x squared. And that'll cancel with the x to the negative two. So this cancels with this, this cancels with this. And now we're just left with dx dt equals 
negative one fifth x squared times one over cosine squared theta times d theta dt. So now all we need to do is plug in all this information and that'll give us our answer. So we already know d theta dt is negative pi over six. We already know theta at this moment we're looking at is pi over three. The only thing we need to figure out is x. To figure out x, we can go back to our original equation. Tan of theta equals five over x. And if we plug in theta, we can use that to solve our x. So doing that will give us tan of pi over three equals five over x. We can multiply the x over and then divide tan of pi over three over. So that gives us x equals five over tan of pi over three. Pi over three is on the unit circle. So we can use the unit circle to figure out this value. Doing that will just tell us that x equals five over the square root of three. So if we plug this in for x, plug pi over three in for theta, negative pi over six in for d theta dt, and then we can just simplify that or plug it into a calculator. And doing that will tell us d x dt equals 10 pi over nine kilometers per minute. And remember that is exactly what represents the speed that the plane is moving. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel. It really is a great way to help support the channel so I can keep making videos like this and help you get through your math class. Really appreciate it. So thank you and see you next time.